Thank you, Gregorius. You know, I think it's very important to have this uh, concept of the symbiosis between the Olympic and the non-Olympic cities represented in the room. Just a special mention here. Uh, Melanie Dupar is, of course, uh, the director of Smart Cities and Sport, the secretary general of the World Union of Olympic City. Let me remind you that this summit is powered by the World Union of Olympic City. And it's truly, I mean, the symbiosis of Olympism and sport culture that uh, unites us all. And it's with this spirit in mind that I would like to welcome on stage President Thomas Bach, the president of the International Olympic Committee, who can uh, sit for a moment here while we come Please, I mean, if you want to take, while well, we welcome also the mayor and the city leaders of the city of Montreal. So Caroline Bourgeois, Executive Committee Vice Chair and Borough Major, City of Montreal, Pierre Abadan, Deputy Mayor of the City of Paris, and Ingun Trossholm, and Mayor of the City of Lilleham. And I would say in that order, I mean, we put first uh, Caroline from Montreal, then Lilleham, and then Paris, and um, I'm uh, taking my things off, mostly because in a second, we are ready to hear the opening speech by uh, President Bach, who I uh, leave the podium with. Please, President, it's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much for allowing me to have already some gymnastics uh, there before uh, coming to uh, the stage. Monsieur uh, le syndic uh, de Lausanne et président de l'Union de Ville Olympique, uh, cher ami uh, Grégoire uh, Junot, dear uh, mayors and representatives of uh, Olympic uh, cities, uh, your excellencies, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. After so many I am inclined to say after too many virtual meetings, uh, it is uh, such a pleasure that we can finally come together again in person for this uh, important occasion. As a Lausannois d'adoption, I can say that it feels great to uh, welcome you back home. This is why I would like uh, to thank the World Union of Olympic Cities under the great uh, leadership of uh, your president and uh, my mayor, uh, Grégoire Junot, for bringing all of us together here in the Olympic capital of uh, Lausanne. Meeting here in Lausanne, of course, also brings back wonderful memories of the Winter Youth Olympic Games Lausanne 2020. Little did we suspect uh, back then that these Winter Youth Olympic Games would be the last Olympic event of a pre-pandemic era. With the global pandemic, our world has changed dramatically. Nothing is as it was before. Already in April 2020, at the outbreak of the pandemic, we said that even once we have overcome the health crisis, we will have to face the far-reaching social, financial, economic and political consequences. They are now exacerbated by the consequences of the war in Ukraine. As representatives of uh, some of the greatest cities of our world, you are on the front lines of these uh, global developments. You witnessed firsthand how the global pandemic has changed our world in fundamental ways. You now are experiencing how the long-term consequences of the pandemic are affecting your communities. To state the obvious, we are facing difficult times. Inflation, exponentially rising energy costs and recession are exacerbating the social, financial and political pressures from the COVID crisis, causing hardship 
and affecting the lives of people everywhere. These challenges we all are facing will not diminish. But precisely therein lies an opportunity for our Olympic community. The IOC is built on the belief that we can make the world a better place through sport. In the face of the confluence of these crises, our mission to put sport at the service of humankind has never been more urgent. This is why the theme of sportification of our cities is so relevant for all of us today. Because by sportifying our cities, we are bringing the power of sport right to the heart of our communities, right to the people. In these difficult and uncertain times, we need this power of sport as a force for good in our communities more than ever. This belief is reflected in our Olympic Agenda 2020 plus five, which is fully focused on strengthening the role of sport as an important enabler for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We are supported in this by the member states of the United Nations General Assembly, who specifically designated sport to play this enabling role in the areas of health, education, social inclusion, gender equality, promoting tolerance and peace. There are several reasons why these SDGs matter in our discussion about sportification. There is, first of all, the philosophical alignment, as, as exemplified by Olympic Agenda 2020 plus five, and its focus to strengthen the role of sport in society. In other words, to make the world a better place through sport. Similarly, the SDGs provide a framework to improve the lives of people and in this way set the course for human development and a brighter future for all. When seen through this perspective, the connection to sportification becomes clear. Our overriding mission is to make the world a better place through sport. And one of the best ways to demonstrate this mission in action is to ensure that people and communities benefit for generations to come from hosting Olympic Games. Health is an excellent illustration of this. The global pandemic has made it crystal clear just how important sport is for our physical and mental health. Sport can save lives. While the health crisis is far from over, we can see already now that sport is widely recognized as an essential factor in fighting the pandemic and as an integral part of the solution for the crisis recovery. Because at the end of the day, when individuals lead healthy and active lives through sport, the community as a whole and society at large benefits as well. But beyond health, sport has a great social significance by being the glue which bonds communities together. Sport plays a significant economic role, creates jobs, generating business activity. This is what brings all of us together today, a belief in the power of sport to be a force for good in the world. Just ask our friends in the Olympic capital of Lausanne. 
The great success of the Winter Youth Olympic Games Lausanne 2020 stands out because of its human legacy. And I would argue its sportification legacy. We have to bear in mind that this was still in a time before COVID. Yes, such a time did once exist. But even these pre-pandemic numbers show how this event really brought the Lausanne and Vaudois community together. 640,000 spectators cheered on and followed the young athletes during this Winter Youth uh, Olympic Games. They did not so only at the sports competitions. Thanks to the Enjeu program, organized in the heart of the city. Hundreds of thousands of people also got active by trying out sports or taking part in cultural activities. In Lausanne alone, 200,000 visitors attended the festival or participated in the many sports uh, initiatives. A key to this great success were partnerships with local schools. Some 80,000 school children attended an Olympic event for the first time and were able to experience Olympism through the many activities organized. I still remember, and it still gives me goosebumps, you could touch the energy at, at uh, the Anjou Festival, right here in uh, the heart of Lausanne. Everyone you spoke to said that the interest and enthusiasm for sport and all the fun activities went far beyond even the boldest expectations. For some sport initiations, you had five times the expected number of kids wanting to try out and play sports. And all this on the streets of the Olympic capital in the middle of Lausanne. It really was a perfect demonstration of spotification in the best sense of the world. This spotification legacy lives on today. The Vaudois Arena, which was renovated in time for the youth games, now offers state-of-the-art facilities to the local population to practice sports like swimming, ice skating, table tennis, and of course, uh, most uh, importantly, uh, the most uh, popular and uh, important uh, sport uh, in uh, our world, uh, fencing. Uh, in, uh, in March uh, this year, the World Generations Champions Legacy Project was launched to strengthen the development of uh, elite athletes. Supported by the IOC, one key element of this Legacy Project is to bring elite athletes and Olympians into classrooms at local schools to inspire the children with sport and our Olympic values, thereby ensuring that this York legacy lives on in the young generation. All of these activities have one overriding goal, encouraging regular physical activity for the people of Lausanne. I'm sure this sportification legacy of Lausanne 2020 resonates with uh, so many of your own experiences of the impact that hosting Olympic Games had in your cities. This, this impact is nothing short of impressive. Thanks to the Olympic Winter Games Beijing 2022, over 300 million people engaged in winter sports. One of the key legacies of the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020 has been that now nearly 70% of adults in Tokyo 
practice sport at least once a week, up from only 53% in 2012. The Olympic cities of Paris and Los Angeles are demonstrating in a great way how sportification can happen even before the Games take place. Already four years ahead of the Olympic Games Paris 2024, they have launched an ambitious program working together with the Ministry of Education to introduce 30 minutes of daily exercise in primary schools throughout France. Since its launch, one third of French schools are already part of the program, demonstrating that you do not have to wait until the games are, uh, are over to benefit from their legacy. With its Terre de Cheux initiative, Paris 2024 has another innovative way to enable all cities and municipalities in France to accelerate their local sportification projects, thereby promoting sport and active lifestyles in the everyday lives of the French people. Even seven years before the opening of the Olympic Games Los Angeles 2028, the IOC and the organizing committee have joined hands with the city of Los Angeles to launch a project called Play LA, an initiative to provide affordable sports programs to young Angelenius. Play LA is made possible through an investment by LA28 and the IOC of $160 million, the single largest commitment to youth sport development in the state of California. Having just recently visited Los Angeles and seeing all the kids and the youngsters being energized and full of joy doing sport, there is no doubt in my mind as to the success of this legacy project. In Olympic cities around the world, from Barcelona to Seoul, LA to London, Pyeongchang to Sydney, Rio to Munich, and so many more, we see similar long-lasting sportification legacies in action. Olympic hosts have a unique opportunity to set an example, to be a benchmark to other cities and communities as the world prepares for the post-pandemic future. You are in a unique uh, position because the urban centers are on the front lines of the factors that are shaping this world. You know firsthand the power of sport to change lives in your cities and communities. You also know that sport is the low-cost, high-impact tool par excellence to support communities in these difficult times. With your collective experience, you, the great Olympic cities of the world, are ideally placed to inspire other communities as we build a more human-centered and inclusive post-pandemic world. From the United Nations to the European Union, the G20 leaders and many more, sport has in the meantime been widely recognized as an essential factor in fighting the pandemic and as an integral part of the solution for the recovery. And it is in cities like yours where this power of sport is translated into reality. Together with all of you, the IOC is ready to shape this new world with our shared Olympic values. Cities are a key partner in this, because shaping the post-pandemic world 
is in the end about people. And it has to happen at your level, the community level, because you are next to the people. All this is taking place in a time when there is a new world order in the making. We can see already now that this new world order will be more divisive than the one we in the Olympic community are striving for. These unfortunate trends alert us, therefore, because it is going against our mission to unite the world. But exactly in these confrontational times, people around the world are looking for a unifying force. A unifying force for good in the world that gives people hope and optimism for the future. A unifying force that brings people together. And this, the Olympic movement can offer. We unite the entire world in peaceful competition. We promote the power of sport as a sport for good in our communities. To emphasize our unifying Olympic mission, we amended our Olympic motto, which now says, faster, higher, stronger, together. The word together highlights that to overcome any challenges we are facing in this world, that to go faster, to aim higher, to become stronger, we need to stand together. And in this uh, Olympic spirit, of uh, solidarity and standing uh, together, I extend the hand of the IOC to all of you to join and to uh, make the world a better place together. And in this spirit of cooperation, of solidarity, and in this uh, spirit of uh, peace, I wish you a very successful summit here in the city of uh, Lausanne. Thank you very much. We are very grateful, President Bach. You reminded us uh, responsibility, uh, the role of cities, the role of Olympic cities in particular. You, I ask you indeed, I mean, to do some gymnastics, and I'm sorry for that, I apologize, but we believe in physical activity. Uh, you've taken us, you've taken us into this tour de force uh, with ideas and projects, enlightening and exemplifying, but also illustrating and inspiring us with theory and practice, global and local. President Bach was so kind to take a few questions, so please uh, let me ask you if there is some uh, comments or question that you would like to pose, I will come with the microphone. I will kindly ask you to introduce yourself and the organization you're from. There were many points that were touched upon by President Bach. Uh, I was myself struck very much, I mean, in terms of linking the local Lausanne dimension, but also this global perspective, the United Nations were brought in. Uh, if the panel wishes also to make questions, I mean, they are free to do so. Uh, let us not be shy. It's a unique opportunity to start off. We had a very beautiful uh, start in terms of the, the, uh, the beginning of the conference with this opening speech. Uh, I can't believe uh, President Bach left you speechless. So I encourage you, because of the leadership, of the cities that you are representing, maybe to make a short comment or uh, uh, a question posed to President Bach. If you can, uh, maybe the lights going down a little bit, I mean, so that I can see if there is, some, there is one question over there. 
I, I'm a true believer in physical activity, so I'm running, <laughs> I mean, so there you go. Thank you so much. Hello, President Back. Uh, Michael Houston here from Inside the Games.biz. I just wanted to ask, based on what you were talking about, um, regarding smart cities and uh, host cities within the Olympic movement, how do you how do you uh, cooperate in a peaceful way with the politicians of these communities uh, to ensure that there is always a, a, a very kind of hormonal uh, environment in the lead up to a Games and uh, as a result in, ensuring that those Olympic values that you, speak, uh, you spoke of are indeed delivered? I, I'm not sure whether I understood uh, you correctly. Uh, uh, the, the, the question was uh, concerning uh, uh, our uh, cooperation uh, with uh, uh, governments and uh, authorities yes, in, could, in uh, Olympic uh, host uh, uh, cities, yes, ensuring, so ensuring uh, the respect uh, for the Olympic uh, values. Yes, especially with politicians maybe being against certain uh, Olympic values. There, uh, uh, we are uh, abiding uh, by uh, the UN uh, 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 principles, uh, there, the, the UNGPs, uh, making sure that uh, within uh, uh, our remit, and this is in this case organizing uh, the uh, Olympic uh, Games, uh, that uh, uh, there, uh, these uh, principles and uh, the human rights uh, are respected. Uh, we uh, have uh, done so uh, in uh, the past, uh, but we have now uh, strengthened uh, this uh, effort and uh, we have, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, taking a more coordinated approach uh, with regard to all of these uh, the questions uh, by having issued uh, a framework uh, on uh, human rights uh, which addresses uh, the, the IOC in its uh, three spheres of uh, responsibility. So that is the IOC as an organization, uh, the, the IOC as being responsible uh, for the Olympic Games, and uh, the IOC as leader of uh, the Olympic uh, 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 movement. And uh, with this uh, framework and, and with this approach, uh, we are again, uh, we are uh, fully in line with uh, uh, the uh, uh, UN uh, GPs, which are clearly stating uh, that uh, every entity or organization can only be held responsible for what is happening within their remit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that... Uh, whatever is happening beyond uh, this uh, remit is uh, the responsibility uh, then uh, of the uh, respective uh, uh, governments. Uh, this is uh, the, the policy we are fo uh, following. Uh, this is, uh, the, uh, these are the UNGPs uh, we are uh, abiding uh, to. And in this way, we ensure that in particular in the framework of the organization of uh, uh, Olympic Games, uh, human rights uh, are uh, fully respected. If there are no more questions, there is one question. Um, let me be fast, <laughs> together. Thank you, hello Mr. Bach, Mr. Premier Schwartz from City of Pilsen. And I was also a participant of Olympic Games 2012 in triathlon. We did try in Pilsen to do what, what you said here, to bring the Olympians and the medalists from world championships to the schools. But in the last three, four years, it seems to be less motivated, the new generation. They don't believe in some persons, in some spiritual sport things. Do you have some doubt, doubt, doubt us if it's still working? the Olympians, the positive motivation at the school? I, I don't know uh, to, to uh, which experience uh, you're referring to. 
But uh, what we can see uh, from, from our perspective and uh, according to uh, the reports uh, we are receiving uh, from uh, the National Olympic Committees uh, around uh, the world, uh, these uh, programs uh, where uh, you put uh, Olympic athletes at uh, the forefront uh, that uh, they are uh, very successful and uh, the, the most successful. This uh, is happening in, in different ways in different parts of uh, the world. In, in some parts of the world uh, you have Olympians uh, traveling around uh, schools and inspiring uh, the young generation. Uh, in others uh, it's happening more uh, uh, online. Uh, but uh, also there, uh, we can uh, see a, a great uh, appreciation. Uh, so I, I, from from our experience, I cannot see a, a decline uh, in uh, in in the interest. What where we can see a, a decline, uh, however, is in the participation. Uh, of uh, uh, young people in, 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 in sport. You know, it is uh, different from engaging uh, with an Olympian uh, to uh, uh, be inspired uh, by uh, the Olympic uh, values. This, this does unfortunately not necessarily mean that then they start practicing sport uh, uh, right away. And uh, this is, uh, you know, why uh, we took uh, so many initiatives uh, to uh, get the young generation playing sport, practicing sport. And there is a, is a very wide range. Uh, one, I think, uh, a great example is uh, to what I've been referring to is in uh, France uh, with the 30 minutes daily exercise in uh, in uh, primary uh, schools uh, others are going uh, until the olympic uh, program uh, where we have uh, introduced uh, this uh, new uh, youth prone uh, sports and uh, disciplines uh, you know like skateboarding or climbing uh, three on three basketball and, and others which are very popular am among uh, the young generation uh, other programs are uh, what we are calling the, the urbanization of uh, sport. Uh, sport nowadays is in a, in a tough competition for the leisure time of the young generation with other activities. Mm. And there the attitudes have, uh, have changed. That means uh, for us in sport, we cannot uh, wait uh, any longer that uh, the kids are coming to us. They will not come if you just wait. And if you have a, a stadium half an hour outside the city or one hour and you organize a wonderful event and uh, you think that it will be full of young people, you will be feeling pretty much alone uh, there. Mm. Uh, that means sport and we have to go where these young people are. In the virtual world and in the real world. In the virtual world, there are in the social uh, media, uh, there are uh, in uh, the e-sports the e and uh, e-games. Mm -hmm. So we have to take them from there. We have to confront them with sport and physical activity there in the digital uh, world and uh, to try to convince them to do real sport. Mm -hmm. And there the, 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 the so-called virtual sports have a, a great advantage because they combine mm. the digital activity with the physical activity. So, uh, you know, if uh, you are riding your bike uh, on on Swift, mm. you'd have the same physical activity 
uh, like uh, somebody participating in, in, in the race. Uh, and uh, there are many sports uh, whom we are encouraging now to take this up uh, by means of uh, our Olympic uh, uh, eSports uh, series and uh, next year most likely in Singapore with an uh, Olympic eSports uh, festival where uh, you know we want to go to this virtual world to address uh, the young generation. And where are they in the real world? They are in the urban centers. That means we have to go with sport to, to the urban centers. And uh, we have, uh, therefore, you know, included in the programs uh, the, the sport I mentioned, which can be played in the urban centers. And what does it mean for you as uh, cities and city planners? It is uh, uh, that in, in the city planning, you should uh, provide sports facilities in the neighborhoods of the people. Not having necessarily you know, the, the, the big centers and, and, and stadia and, uh, uh, somewhere in, in the city or at the outskirts of the city. But to have uh, uh, playgrounds, uh, to have uh, sporting facilities, to have sports initiation programs in the neighborhood. So that these uh, young people are at least confronted with the sports activity. Because otherwise, they will, they will have no, no experience with sport if you don't confront them with it, if you don't go where they are. And this is uh, what we have uh, to, to address uh, in, in, in this uh, respect of uh, sportification of cities and uh, societies. And there then to close the circle, uh, there uh, Olympic athletes and successful uh, athletes can uh, play a very important inspi and inspiring role. We have to go where young people are, virtually and physically. Uh, let me thank uh, President Bach for having enlightened and set the scene, to a certain extent anticipating some of the issues that will be discussed today and tomorrow. Tomorrow in particular for the gentleman about the question about the next generation, we will be tackling Generation Z, Z, Z uh, and, and, and another critical issue. Let me thank President Bach for the frankness also of taking this uh, also challenging question. We are facing challenging times, but let me also express a note of gratitude towards your leadership in the sense that I'm going by heart and off script, I mean, but the for example, I mean, I see very symbolic, under your leadership, I see very symbolic and substantial initiative, like the IOC Young Leaders uh, Program, things that I have concrete, tangible, leading the path forward, the refugee initiative. So, I mean, uh, it's really important to see, to see this thing happening. If I have one last question on the one or the one sentence advice that you would give to city. Because if I'm to summarize up in one concept, I would say you are prudent, but you also encourage city. Would that suit, I mean, as a summary of the sentiment that you wish to express to city, Olympic and all that? I would uh, take the prudent out uh, and would, uh, <laughs> would uh, concentrate on, uh, on the confidence and in, 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 in encouragement. Uh, yes, we are living in difficult times, uh, but uh, every crisis is offering opportunities. And we have seen this uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, for sport, uh, the opportunity to emphasize the important role of uh, sport in uh, society, in, in many uh, respects. And uh, this is how we have uh, approached uh, this uh, crisis, and this is how we are uh, approaching the other challenges uh, we, are, we are facing. Let's look at the opportunities and there the encouragement and the offer is uh, there to uh, work uh, together uh, in, uh, in, in, in this way and to seize the opportunities uh, these uh, crises are offering 
uh, for a more human-centered and inclusive world. I think uh, our, our round of applause is deserved. And uh, I'm looking around. I'm not too sure. I think you're, uh, there is. Uh, I don't want to step into a protocol uh, crisis now. I mean, or time crisis. I mean, I know. I mean, you have uh, uh, a busy uh, day. We will be starting off gradually and now, I mean, in discussing also the sportification that you just illustrated with three city leaders, I mean, uh, so let me thank you once again for uh, the leadership you brought in theory, but also in practice. Uh, and we move slowly, I mean, to the next uh, session. Thanks a lot, President Bafo. <laughs> we need new maps. Uh, but action is what defines uh, this. Uh, maybe there is not a common language. There is different angles to it. I will not go into this slide, I mean, mostly because we're having three one, unique uh, city leaders here. But let me just say this about this uh, slide, I mean. Uh, the Olympic movement, the IOC in particular, is leading the path in terms of the Olympic agenda. Uh, the OECD, who's present in the room, uh, has some special a uh, new initiative on global events and local development. There was last week, uh, or a week or so ago, the Global Status Report on Physical Activities. You can go and check it out, but without further ado, let me move into sportification. And for sportification, we are going now into directly into the, uh, the sportification of cities, redesigning territories to bring sport closer to the people. To kick off the summit, we will hear from mayor cities uh, from around the world uh, on the stakes of sportification of cities. Why is sport so important in today's societies and for cities? Why are, what are the opportunities and challenges for ambitious cities like the one we're having here today that take decisive action to be more active? And what are the main steps to be taken to achieve a more physically active population in the coming years? We had, I just introduced uh, them quickly, Caroline Bourgeois from the city of Montreal, Borough Major and uh, Executive Committee Vice Chair. Yes, there it is. Uh, we have uh, Ingun Trosholmen from the city of Lillehammer, Mayor. And we have Pierre Adabadan from the city of Paris, Deputy Mayor in charge of sport, Olympics, Paralympic Games and the Seine. And we will be questioning what is beyond and beyond the concept of sportification with these three leaders and with concrete examples. So sportification is all about using the assets across uh, all areas of a city. And we will explore in this two days conference all the different areas of cities and consider them as potential places for sport. We will begin now with city halls. And city halls are very important because they are a place that embodies local power, local authorities and local politics. We will look at political representative and how they integrate sport as a tool for public policies and how they see their territory, the public space, as an endless resource for the creation of new sport places and new incentives for sport. Sportification is about approaching the city as a place for sport as opposed to or in addition to having sport places. So in this respect, active design is at the heart of urban planning. So the first question, we go to Montreal, to the city of Montreal, which is a well-known pioneer city in active city design. So the first question, and if you don't mind, I will call you by your city, I mean, because you're a city representative, so we are proud of that in particular. I hope that, again, I won't be breaking any protocol or rule, <laughs> uh, but I hope you allow me. So Montreal, could you share with us your vision of active design and give us some example? Yes, thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to me uh, to be here tonight, today, yes, to uh, talk about Montreal. And we want to transform our city through simple actions to improve the quality of life of our citizens, but and the health of our population. So maybe you heard about uh, some examples. Um, for now, the Réseau Express Vélo. It's an ambitious bike -way project in Montreal. We're talking about 184 kilometers that allow citizens to travel into the city 
even during the winter in Canada. So um, it's safe for cyclists who are protected from cars. It's an active design, an active transportation, and now economic development measure for local businesses on those streets. So um, we have other, other examples um, in our downtown since the last year, we have a multi-purpose cultural, sports and public space named the Esplanade de Tranquille, attracting people in the summer as well as in the winter. There is an uh, outdoor skating ring that is refrigerated. We are proud to be uh, this winter city and this kind of installation in downtown is already a success. Uh, we have this uh, festive energy in Montreal because uh, we are in the Quartier des Spectacles with festival and cultural events with, the, with all those uh, activities. And maybe for a last example, yeah, if, I, if I have time, we are also proud of our green and white alley. It's very Montreal for people who have the chance uh, to go in our city. It's a co-creation of a safe environment for and by citizens. They allow the Montreal population to benefit from an additional local space to maintain an active neighborhood life. So we have two, uh, our 10 pedestrian streets in the last summer. It was a really big success. We can walk in the city as a mean of transportation, promoting an active lifestyle by uh, and, um, and, uh, thinking our facilities with all those active design who can change the, the, the lifestyle and the health of population. So I know you have to be quick. I will be quick myself, simplifying a little bit. But let me say sportification means bringing sport closer to the people. We need diagnosis. We need indicators. So Montreal, again, sports venue infrastructure-based studies was realized in order to address the imbalances of the Montreal territory. How has the city rethought its global sport investment? Uh, with key indicators, it, there's an, a, um, a big argument for uh, equity. It's so important that we have this equity in a geographic sense because wherever you live in the city, every citizen needs to have uh, the same sport offering. And it's not easy because we know historically some neighborhoods add more services, but it's a it's really, really big issue. And um, for that key indicators, we are working with, um, we adopted a nature and sports plan, which has a vision of daily physical activity in the city. So the focus is important on this territorial equity for neighborhoods that have received uh, historically less funding for sports uh, facilities. We are working um, together with uh, public health and the education committee to document uh, the health conditions of city of Montreal, the Montrealais, the Montrealais, in order to take concrete action. So this collaboration is so important. And we have an example in the eastern part of Montreal. We said there are fewer uh, bike paths and the four children cycle less to school. So based on these studies, on this collaboration with educational and health services, we are better equipped now to plan the development future, the bike paths to counteract this uh, territorial equity. So it's one of the examples of this collaboration and the, the key um, studies to, uh, to make better for uh, next generations. Lilleama. Lilleama has used the Global Active Cities certification uh, as a way of improving the segment of the population in terms of sport and physical activities. Uh, Lilleama again was a pioneer city with the Global Active City Label to improve citizen health and physical activity. Can you tell us something about that in particular? Yes. First of all, I want to thank you for uh, bringing me on stage and thank you for having uh, some time to tell about Lillehammer. It's mm -hmm. a very, very small city and the World Union visited last year, so you know what I'm talking about. But we have uh, huge arenas from the Olympic uh, Games in 1994 and in 2016. And uh, of course also uh, 
pretty healthy inhabitants uh, living there because they are, they are more or less sports. But I want to say that um, uh, this process of certification has systemized the plan that we already uh, were doing and uh, highlighting uh, how uh, small initiatives can um, make people more active. So I just want to have some three concrete, uh, very small steps, but um, but uh, um, it's it's um, it's very important to bring people together and to to make them more active. So we opened our children's park in the north end of the city, and that brings children, parents, and grandparents together. Uh, being ac active and it's uh, beyond what we imagined uh, of uh, people um, going to that park. We also d did another thing. We opened a dog park. So <laughs> all dogs, they have an owner, so they have to walk the dog to the park and they meet other people. And the most unhealthy a thing in the Norwegian societies and maybe also all over the world. It's loneliness. So it's very important to socialize. So we see that uh, people meeting there, they make new friends. Very important also. And then we have something called the pole hunt. So that is uh, poles or sticks that are situated in the center of the city, but also in the mountains. And then you collect them and you, um, uh, it's a competition. So this activates families, children, young people and old people and um, has been a success as well. We also have some free yoga in the park. So the people that wants to, to make new friends can go to the park and, and do some yoga. So this is st small steps. Uh, that we do in, in Lillehammer. So we go to Paris. I mean, we had, uh, you have the perspective, of course, of hosting the 2024 Olympic Games. But I was wondering, I mean, to a certain extent, how has Paris conducted a comprehensive diagnosis on the sport offered in the city in order to elaborate and monitor its action plan? Thank Paris. you. Hi, everyone. Thank, thank you for having me here. Uh, just uh, a few comments on, on that point. Uh, in uh, 2017, we received the opportunity to organize the next uh, uh, Olympic uh, and Paralympic Games. So we had a question. How uh, we can understand what the people will expect with the organization of this massive event? And uh, how, uh, what, what are the keys to develop sports and even for persons who are really far for the everyday practicing. So um, we firstly, uh, we try to, uh, to involve our associations. And uh, we had a consultation of uh, 10,000 persons with several meetings. And uh, we put a legacy plan, uh, firstly, to know where to go. So uh, after that point, uh, we created this uh, legacy plan. And um, the four main things we can uh, w uh, the people wait for that is uh, having more facilities uh, in general, but sp specifically, and the president bar speak about it, um, is uh, to have facilities just close to your everyday life. So close to your work, close to your house, uh, to be an easy, an easy thing to make physical activities. So it was the first point. So we understand or we understood before, but we have the opportunity to accelerate this transformation, uh, that uh, we need to adapt the city of this life that people want. So uh, organize the, the, uh, the Olympic and Paralympic Games could be and could have this acceleration of transforma uh, transformating city. So uh, that was uh, the first concept we have, and uh, we have a specific and urban and compact city, so uh, we need to find solution of that and we, uh, uh, we try to develop it, but I, I will speak about it uh, just after. And the uh, second thing I would like to say is uh, we need to, we understand that we need to create specific program. Mm -hmm. So specific program for specific target, for a person who are far away from the practicing or for a specific person like 
children, women, di uh, diseased uh, person, mm. and uh, uh, senior, <laughs> if I can say that. Yeah. So, uh, so it was the main point for that. So we organized our sports politics uh, of the city uh, around this uh, diagnosis, and uh, and we try to do it since now uh, uh, five years. And uh, I'm happy two years before the game to say that we achieve it. Yes. So uh, and actually we we will try to push it more uh, with the local uh, organization uh, of Paris 2024. But we are on a, on a good way. So let me ask. I mean, you to accelerate. I mean, I will accelerate myself. I mean, <laughs> having a time. I mean, I will protect you. you, did you it. I mean, but I, I not so you, much. I, I mean, you. if there is some uh, some some people jumping on stage, let me say. I mean, let us stick with Paris. Sportification is about destructuring the sport practice, and cities offer the opportunity to practice sport outside of the institutionalized system, like we saw yesterday. Um, how is the public space used to offer? free, no-cost, safe sport practice in both adapting the population needs and anticipating them? So, as I said, we try to put this reflection on a concrete organization. So, yeah. uh, we had a specific uh, um, person in the city of Paris and uh, we organized programs. I, I will give you some examples. Uh, every Sunday, on different places in the city, uh, we organize uh, free lessons and free initiation of sports. Uh, so we have uh, something like uh, between 12 and 15 every Sunday morning around uh, 9 and 12. Uh, we have a specific target and we work with our association, with the French federations, and uh, they come to make discover sports or activities. So it's a free program and uh, you, this initiative uh, try to catch uh, people who are far away from uh, the practice. And how do you say, how it's able to do that? Uh, you have a connection with a social uh, association, local and social association. So uh, they make the publicity of this concept and the people come. There is no competition uh, approach and there is just a distraction for and, and social, uh, social affect, firstly. And uh, sometimes they push to discover sports, and uh, well, uh, weeks after weeks, they will finish by going to a club. So uh, the opposition between the free practicing just down of your uh, of your living place and uh, the club is, is not a good way for us. I, I think we have to work together on that, and our federation now understand this opportunity. They have to catch the public who are far away from this organization and bring them in the federation. So, and the municipalities, the cities could be a link uh, between the free practicing and this organization. So I just give you two more examples. We have this organization on the Saturday morning. We did exactly the same thing on the, on the Saturday morning with the family concept. So uh, in the gymnasium, you can come with your children and your children make an activity and just next to him, if you can share it with him, you do it. It depends on the activity. But if you are not able, well, all the parents may, uh, make a sports activity just next to them. So that's another key for women, for example, who, uh, who are uh, alone with the children or dad sometimes. And uh, you, you don't have time to make sports. So in here you can do it, it's free, and you can find it in several places in Paris. Uh, we have uh, uh, other kind of, uh, of organization like that about the seniors, for example, after 60 years old, uh, we have uh, 5,000 plus place uh, every year. Uh, you can go and uh, having an inscription, it's free, and uh, you have several activities every week, you have meetings, and, uh, and you can uh, practicing that for one or two years. But after two years, if you want to follow, and we hope everyone wants to follow it, you have to go to a club, having an inscription, and follow you practicing every day. So uh, this socialization is essential, and for LC business, uh, not business, but... 
you know, uh, LC things too. Yes, uh, we thank the organizer for having given us an extra bonus. It's extremely important because you are really exemplifying and making concrete example into the concept of sportification. We have 40 minutes, so and I have seven questions. So I mean, I ask you, I mean, to help me. Yeah. Uh, if not, I have to drop some question, which n would not be nice. If I do, you can insert. You know, the, okay. the bonus is you, or the strategic option is you insert. You know what you want to say in the question I group. I mean, so help me with that. Yes. Uh, so Montreal, with nature and natural resources available in the heart of the city, how does the city adapt its outdoor sport offer to seasonal condition? Yeah, we want to encourage the participation uh, in outdoor activities and uh, especially in winter. Yeah. I talked about with uh, some cities yesterday and uh, this is uh, an issue that we have uh, to face up. So having the good equipment is an issue. Uh, for kids uh, in Montreal, uh, sports equipment such as skates and snowshoes are available for free in uh, many parks. I, I hope you will come uh, in Montreal and enjoy the Parc du Mont-Royal. It's the mountain in the, city, in the center of the city and uh, you will see those uh, activities because uh, parks are a great sporting vocation. Uh, we have the Parc Jarry, a large uh, tennis uh, facility that hosts the international uh, Omnium with the best players on the planet. But the rest of the year, it's the, all the neighborhoods um, who are next of this park, who enjoyed that multifunctional playground, uh, cricket, basketball, soccer, volleyball. In the winter, cross-country, uh, ski trails, sledding hills, ice rinks uh, in the pond. So we are an island, so we have um, to enjoy of all those facilities, but all those uh, geographic, uh, like uh, waterfront parks, um, new, beach new beaches now we have in uh, Montreal. Um, we have a, a big wave, uh, we call it the Vague Aguie, <laughs> so for those who are interested, where surfers from all over the world, they are not coming only in California, but in Montreal too, mm. to enjoy those uh, incredible uh, equipment. So. Uh, we have begun to uh, the creation of a new waterfront parks who are really popular, but when one big uh, idea and orientation, uh, we put an end to the privatization of those shores to make it a place for everyone, every kids, every people in the city who want to swimming, kayaking, paddle boarding and other sports activities can be practiced. So it's all in our planification to, uh, to make those installations uh, better accessible for all uh, of people. We go to Lillehammer. As a small city surrounded with nature, Lillehammer offers a wide range of free outdoor activities, both for inhabitants, but also for event hosting. I mean, what is the strategy behind this? Well, the strategy is very simple, to get people to move. And that's because of the health uh, uh, measures, preventive health measures. The benefits of having a healthy population keep the kids away from the drugs and the parents away from diabetes. That's, that's the whole point of keeping the inhabitants moving. Uh, so that's the strategy. And um, I would... Uh, uh, as I think we are out of time, uh, I want to tell a story about uh, something, so I'm, I'm sure to, to have the time to, to tell it. Because I reopened something called Bua, actually last week, and the letters in this name, Bua, uh, stands for Children, Youth and Activity. Combine these letters becomes a word meaning the shed or the storage room that people have in their house, houses for storing uh, sport equipment. But we made this uh, the shed or buaven in the town, the city center, just across the library. And uh, no one, I think, is ashamed to go into the library and lend books for free because we are used to that. So we just situated Bua then across the library and it's a huge space for sport equipment. So families, uh, 
uh, tourists and everyone can go inside and uh, lend sport equipment for free. And it's not crappy sport equipment, it's good one. Mm. <laughs> so, so you can feel that it's good equipment when you, you enter the field of sports. So that's, I think that's uh, very important because, because of the stigma if you don't have the money to partic yeah. participate, but you need the sport equipment and you want to, uh, to be a part of a group that you can uh, actually go there and lend some sport equipment and then uh, nobody knows that you have done it if yeah. you are ashamed of it. And, uh, it makes uh, everyone a part of, of sports. It's very important. But sportification is also adapting cities to sport. We go to Paris now, and the question is really this. Uh, with, when nature is limited in the urban area, uh, then not building, non-building, I mean, becomes the strategy. Uh, how does Paris compensate for the impossibility of building more sports facilities by using the urban environment in creative way that allows sports to coexist with other activities? Yeah, it's a hard question for us because yeah. uh, uh, we have a 1.5 million slot a year with uh, 2,000 clubs and associations. Uh, so it's difficult to answer to all uh, demands that we have. We are, we are not able to do it actually. So we have to reinvent and try to find a new solution, extension of hours of practicing, for example. But we have to rebuild and uh, rethink how we use the city. As, as I said, uh, we have to create some small uh, equipment uh, e everywhere we can do it, uh, even in uh, patrimonial and uh, uh, historical cities. So not, not uh, every time easy, but we try to do it. We rethink. Uh, our square and parks, because during the COVID crisis, uh, we can see that it's uh, in the urban city center. This is a place where the people are going to make activities and physical activities. So we have to rethink that. And uh, for sure, it works uh, to, on the active design. You spoke about it for Montreal with the biking. Uh, for example, we, we use it a lot actually in Paris, uh, may, you maybe know. But uh, we uh, redesign a new area. For example, uh, with the Olympics and Paralympic Games, the only uh, material legacy we have in, in the north of Paris in the entrance. So we build a new arena, but we change all the suburb uh, from this point to the center of Paris uh, in the active design. So that's another opportunity. And the final one uh, is um, it's an opportunity around uh, the organization of the Olympics. Um, I, as you maybe know, uh, we try to requalify the, the river scene and uh, we will do it. So uh, uh, we know that, <coughs> sorry, with the climate change, yes. we need to have a fresh area. And so we, we try to redesign the occupation uh, ar around the river scene and we will have a new swimming pool after the Olympics kind of swimming pool uh, in uh, and uh, around the, the river scene. So that's another place when you can do physical activities uh, in general. Uh, and so uh, uh, we, we are really happy with that. So sportification is about optimizing access to sport for all. I mean, social inclusion is an issue. People with disabilities, women, foreigners, the elderly. Lila, we made the example of Bua, so if you don't mind, we go to uh, Montreal and then uh, last round, uh, of question. Montreal, how do Montreal specific choices in event hosting strategy contribute to promoting the value of sports such as social integration? Yes, yeah, social integration is the key. So uh, we developed and adapted the sports event uh, hosting strategy. It was really important to maintain our leadership and remain uh, an important sports destination and the national uh, levels and as an Olympic city, as we are near here now. Um, for the past 28 years, uh, 
The city of Montreal has hosted a, a great event, very emotional too, uh, when you assisted at the Défi Sportif Altergo, a unique event that brings together uh, athletes of all ages and all functional limitations within the city's Olympic facilities. So, uh, in the so it, it is Saint Claude Robillard in Montreal. Um, this strategy for other events make it possible to host such events as the uh, World uh, Paratriathlon Series in July um, uh, 2022 at the Parc Jean Drapeau. Uh, other one, the Born Again Basketball Enlightenment a Metropolitan Basketball event hosted more than uh, 2,000 youths. Uh, it also builds bridges between um, different communities. So uh, we need to continue to promote those events, prioriser, so tourism, thank you, uh, that it is intelligent and diversified. Uh, the implementation of a coordinated, uh, proactive, human integrated approach uh, to uh, monitoring uh, so uh, social inclusion and hosting major events is also a priori uh, priority yes for the city and uh, for those events that we have in Montreal. So sportification is about going beyond sport, as you rightly say, I mean, and taking advantage of major sports events to combine with other policies, such as tourism and culture. Lilam, uh, your last word, you can add a little bit, I mean, into it, I mean, but the question here is, you hosted the 1992 Olympic Games, 2016 Youth Olympic Games, and many top world competition. Small city, amazing facility. Small city, big impact. What is the city's strategy for optimizing this major event strategy to promote tourism and winters, uh, make this from a winter sport paradise into an all year long tourist destination? Yes. First of all, since this is uh, the World Union of Olympic Cities, we hosted the Olympics in 1994, just to get it right. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, due to anniversaries and so on. Um, we actually, we have, uh, Lillehammer is also a tourist destination. And I think uh, also because of the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, and then you add on with all the things that you can do in the summertime. So uh, for instance, uh, for instance uh, the downhill ski arena in the next municipality, Hafjell, it's made into a bike park in the summer. And then you have the family park. It's uh, all about uh, fairy, fairy tales and trolls. Uh, and you have a lot of museums. You have six museums. Uh, but still, the Olympic arenas uh, is one of the most popular, if not the most popular place to visit in the summertime. So the international tourists, they go to see the ski jump, yes. yeah, and the arenas. But um, um, what is good for the inhabitants is good for the tourists and vice versa. So uh, we try to think uh, that we cannot add on things that the population cannot use, because this is a very small place with 28,000 inhabitants, right. but we still have uh, top world um, uh, championships. So it's a, it's a very uh, strange situation. I think we could have uh, been better in um, the strategy for, for how to use these uh, big events, actually. And of course, we will uh, work harder on that in, in the future. It's uh, difficult to say if we are good or not, uh, not but we have a lot of tourists uh, visiting uh, us in the middle of uh, Norway without the sea coast uh, and without the, the highest mountains. So I think the impact of the Olympics in 1994, also the Youth of Olympics in 2016, is uh, a part of that. Thank you. Last, you see, Pierre, you see yeah. what I'm saying, I mean, but the last question is for you, how can the game be a booster for tourism and culture, which is both for the inhabitants, but also the visitors? We will be speaking afterwards, I mean, but a short view on that. 
Yeah, I have five seconds, so I, I will be late, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but but I, I will do it quickly. Uh, three points. Uh, maybe firstly, you know, uh, on the culture uh, uh, way, uh, we have an opportunity when you're receiving an Olympic uh, Games uh, is uh, to make a link between the arts and sports. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, on that way, we work on the artistic residence in the sports area in Paris. So we put it in the, in uh, in uh, act already already and it's working very well. Second thing I would like to underline is uh, uh, a specific program on the basket three three renovation courts, and actually uh, we works with uh, uh, sponsors of uh, Paris 2024 with the, uh, with the state and uh, we renovate more than. Uh, uh, 20 uh, f field of basketball already, and we go uh, approximately to 40 uh, to 50 in 2020 in 2025. Four. So uh, it's uh, a really massive invest we have all together here, and that's uh, what I would like to say. It's uh, organized uh, Olympics and Paralympic Games have to be uh, two things: an acceleration of transformation we need in the city for acceptation. It's uh, really essential, and we need to transform the everyday life of the people in the city, accelerating the transformation we need. So, uh, uh, as uh, the president Bar say, uh, it's uh, essential to demonstrate the utility of sports, the everyday sports, but all the effects we need to have with. And um, uh, for tourism, maybe a last word because uh, yeah. I know. Yeah, I know you. Are, I, I, I see. I see you red. I, I see you dark eyes. So uh, now the, the last thing I say is for tourism. For sure, pa Paris uh, has a, a massive tourism tourism uh, all years. But uh, since a long time now, we, t we decided to uh, make sports a tourism attractivity, yeah. and uh, we do it really now. Uh, with uh, the, the biggest events uh, receiving Oli Olympic and Paralympic Games, but we received before that uh, a little bit more than uh, 15 massive international events, and that creating an attractivity now in the city, in the sports side. So uh, we are really happy to, to, to follow it and uh, follow the, the city transformation we need using sports for that. So the dream of Paris is to have a 15-minute cities. It wasn't a 15-minute panel. I mean, we squeeze in as much information as possible. I mean, uh, reinventing, rethinking, accelerating transformation, as somebody said, get people on the move, I mean, and do that, I mean, through the different segments of society. And of course, I mean, with the example of your city is, you know, the, 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 the things that you are doing is really demonstrating in practice what sportification of cities means, I mean, to all of us. So a big round of applause for our first panel. And